Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to MarTech India Bridge, the first in a series of events where marketing, technology, and digital media professionals will congregate on a single platform to discuss the latest developments in modern marketing in the new normal post-COVID world. The corona pandemic has changed lives all over the world nearly overnight. Thanks to everybody staying indoors, traffic has spurted, whether it's people posting their pictures of Dalgona coffee on Instagram or making TikTok videos or even playing Ludo online. But has that increased traffic meant more conversions? The consumer's survivalist mentality during this time may not immediately give way to the growth mindset. It is likely that even after opening up, per capita consumption could show muted growth in the next three to five years as people learn to live within their means and start valuing a less wasteful lifestyle. Martech India Bridge will offer an opportunity to identify, evaluate, and implement time-saving, profit-generating marketing strategies. Welcome. I'm Anisha Nayar Thavand. Thank you, Anisha. This is Rohail. I'm your co-host today. I'll just uh, briefly give you an overview of what is expected today. So we have uh, the inaugural keynote by Dr. Anurag Batra, uh, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief of in Info Media Group and Business World. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, a keynote by Dr. Apoorva Durga, analyst and founder, Alt View Advisory. We have a panel discussion on marketing technology India that India needs. We have a success story by Aparna Mahesh of uh, Bank Bazaar. You know, it's a discussion, very insightful discussion. And finally, a keynote by Jared uh, Jingras uh, on the state of the art Martech stacks, what it looks like. So, very exciting lineup uh, uh, today. Um, we can start with a keynote. Yes, so, so let's get started and uh, set the ball rolling. Uh, please welcome the legend who's a serial entrepreneur, media mogul, a journalist, an eternal optimist, all rolled into one, Dr. Anurag Batra, the chairperson and editor in chief of Exchange for Media. Dr. Batra. Thank you. Thank you, Anisha. You've been a you've been a journalist, you know, so you're not you're not somebody who's just an anchor, you are going to Understand what is understand what is happening in marketing, online experiences, and so on and so forth. So it's you know, first of all, I want to start by saying that we at Exchange for Media have a great team, and there are practitioners. I look around what's happening around us, so I have a bird's eye view. And even in our businesses, we want to integrate technology more and more as we go along. As uh, every business needs to be tech, it has to be tech. If you're in education, it has to be, without calling it a medicine, um, is health tech. So every business is tech. But uh, Exchange for Media's core is the CMOs, the marketers. I've been saying that the role of the CMO, the CIO, the CTO, and the CDO, the Chief Digital Officer, is kind of coming into one. So. While we have excellent speakers, I'll keep to my time of five minutes and I, let me give you my seven trends uh, of MarTech in India. Also, as uh, more and more money will go in performance marketing, you know, uh, marketing through digital will get a higher share because marketers are focused on making sure that the money they spend also produces revenue. Um, and also enhances the relationship. The first trend is that if you talk to any marketer, anybody who's selling products, good services, they will talk to you about omni-channel. The experience is omni-channel. Uh, so getting the omni-channel experience right will happen through MarkTech. Uh, because right now it's a buzzword, we talk about it. Uh, so omni-channel is the biggest trend that marketers need to get right as we move to a contactless economy. And it's been forced on us, but it may lead to a change consumer behavior. So one is getting the omni-channel experience right. Then second is data unification. Now you may have multiple, uh, so omni-channel and data unification go hand in hand. The rapid glorification of data will lead to need for data unification and consolidation. So all the tools you have with the CRM tools, so you need one single tool to unify data. Second, a third is 100% mobile device experience making uh, 
will make e-commerce thing of the past. So everything will happen through a mobile uh, mobile device. Now digital native like Tokopedia, Lazada are excelling in the space by developing in-app games. So gamification. So how do you enhance the mobile experience using MarkTech? Fourth is video consumption. We are doing this over Zoom. There are other video platforms. So how do you uh, how do you enhance this video experience? So the tech surrounding it will also develop. Fifth is the rise in voice search. We'll see VSO overtake SEO. So voice searches will possibly grow more than SEO. And you know, we've been talking of artificial intelligence for 65 years, not much, 65 years. Uh, that's when artificial intelligence as a term was coined. And you know, currently artificial and machine learning had become important in every business, but I think you will see the growth of artificial intelligence and machine learning and its integration in how a marketer takes his or her decisions. Last but not but not. AR, VR. For the last five years, we've been talking of AR VR. Finally, marketers will make more investments in AR VR. As the virtual digital experience needs to be enhanced, the AR VR will become really, uh, you know, experience enhancers. So these are my opening comments. Uh, I look forward to learning from uh, other speakers, other stalwarts, practitioner leaders, tech evangelists. And I'm sure our ecosystem of marketeers uh, on exchangeformedia.com, impactonnet.com, pitchonnet.com, and other associated sites will also learn. Back to you, Anisha and Ruel. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for this wonderful uh, address. Uh, up next, we have uh, Dr. Apurva Durga, who is the analyst and founder of Altview Advisory. Welcome, Mr. Durga, to this uh, amazing uh, lineup of speakers that we have today at our the right martech stack that will go on the series every day for the next four days that we'll be continuing and uh, mr durga will be speaking about uh, i'm just just a minute okay uh, you can go on please sorry okay you started uh, okay uh, thank you Roy. Uh, i'm just sharing my screen so is my screen visible Yes, yes. It's okay, so th thank you, thank you for, for having me here. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Apur Durga and I am founder of Altview Advisory, a research and advisory firm uh, based in Delhi. As an analyst and consultant, I cover several marketing technology marketplaces. So thank you to everyone for joining this session today. There are a lot of great sessions lined up in this event and I am looking forward to learning from the practitioners and gurus. For this session though, I hope to give you an overview of emerging technologies or in other words, what should a tech marketer's toolbox consist of as we move into 2020s? Oh, by the way, if you are on Twitter and you want to feel like tweeting, please use the hash Martech India hashtag. That will be helpful for other people who are following this on Twitter. So a brief introduction of what Altview does. Uh, it is essentially a vendor agnostic firm that helps customers sort out their MarTech choices. Uh, this includes helping you build your own stack, picking up the right tools, benchmarking your readiness with competition and so on. I also run a MarTech masterclass that covers a variety of aspects uh, ranging from basics of MarTech to building a MarTech business case to product selection and so on and so forth. So with that out of the way, let, let us just jump in. Um, this is what we will broadly cover. Uh, Mar Mar MarTech is essentially marketing plus technology, right? So we will talk a bit about the challenges that today's marketers face. We will then look at uh, the state of marketing technology and technologies that can help sort out some of those challenges or mitigate some of those challenges. And then we will have a look at the landscape maps that are becoming popular and plans for our own India specific MarTech map. So, that, so that's, that's really what, what we will look at. Uh, so let's look at uh, the challenges that marketers face and, and Dr. Batra touched upon this about, about the fact that omnichannel is important. It is, it is a major issue that marketers face. But we know that uh, 
omni channel experience is completely broken uh, especially in india uh, no matter where when or why the interaction is happening i as a customer should always feel as if i am talking to the same brand consistency is very important but that rarely happens even in 2020 many brands deliver an experience that is completely fragmented and disjointed and different across different touch points there are several examples the other day i booked a demand draft on a bank's website to be picked up from a nearest branch but when i reached the branch they had absolutely no clue they didn't know why i was there and then there are other examples so here's here's one more so i i got this email uh, with with a brilliant offer uh, for a specific handset but when i actually get, went to the website this is what i see right so completely different uh, uh, prices now you could argue that this happened because uh, by the time i clicked on the offer that offer was gone right but but that that's not the case so here's another example this one from their competitor now first i don't know why they send me this email because uh, i have never looked at these kind of products but to 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 buttress my point uh, you will see that on the email here's the product details it is exactly the same product that is there on the website but now with a different mrp right now you could argue that the offer price has changed but mrp changing that 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 really that just doesn't then it makes sense right and the only plausible reason for that to happen would be if the underlying data sources for different channels are not in sync with each other and 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 we see this very very often right here's another example linkedin sends me this email with a dollar 50 coupon code for uh, for for their linkedin marketing uh, linkedin campaigns so i go to the website and apply this coupon and the message that i get is that this coupon is already gone now if if that coupon is already gone or if the coupon is already used why send me an email in the first place right you often get smss presenting you to pay bills when you already paid them right i am sure almost everybody gets them and then they have a disclaimer saying please ignore if paid but why do you have to have a disclaimer if your underlying systems are consistent across all the channels so we see a number of such examples across different uh, uh, different verticals different uh, retailers different type of service providers here's another example uh, why this happens right so here i'm trying to explain why that kind of thing happens so they, this is an e grocery retailer and on their website i use one identity and on their facebook page i use another identity and the two identities are completely different they have separate email ids and it is not really a trivial exercise to map these two separate identities to one common user which is which is me in this case and here there are only two channels right for big brands there could be 40 channels 50 channels multiple websites email mobile social all of those and if customers have so many identities it is going to be a very challenging exercise to map them to one one single identity and then there are more, uh, more 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 and more challenges and goals that today's marketers are struggling to achieve now there are several things so so some of these challenges we have, we have covered but there are others like content recommendation personalized user experience predictive analysis uh, analytics how do you give uh, how do you how, how do you provide next best kind of actions recommend some things to people do analytics create a single unified view of users so several of these things are are what today's marketers are facing can technology address them is there enough technology to address them well it turns out there is and lots of it right so this is a famous uh, martech uh, 5000 technology landscape by scott brinker scott is doing a keynote later uh, but for now i will give a quick background of this this is a humongous graphic and it has logos of 8000 martech vendors you see these different different colored continents these are the categories uh, of these uh, vendors and uh, scott helpfully lists them lists these categories on the left there are six categories that that he mentions these are all different types of software 
and over time this graphic has grown at a crazy rate as you can see on the on the part here right from from about 1000 solutions in 2014 to 8000 now huge right that's a huge growth now here's the thing it still does not contain all the vendors and there are several more including several regional as well as vertically specialized vendors so vendors who 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 target specific verticals like finance or, or retail or vendors that are popular in specific geographies like india not a lot of them find space here right so essentially even though this uh, this contains 8000 vendors there are several more and this marketplace is full of thousands of products vendors and projects that claim to do what you need essentially everyone calls them a martech vendor even if all they have is a rich text editor or a simple page builder so essentially there's a lot in this marketplace and it is important to structure this marketplace for your own understanding so let's make an attempt to structure the marketplace a bit in next few slides here are some of the some of the ways that i have i have used to categorize different vendors uh, the most common way to categorize these vendors is based on the functionality they provide so we will talk about that a bit later in 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 the slides Uh, you can also categorize these vendors based on tiers so a vendor could be a sweet vendor like oracle ibm etc they could be best of breed vendors and this question keeps coming up very often we will talk about this also later uh, in in some detail then you can categorize vendors based on their support for for specific industry verticals or domains so there are solutions that target uh, specific verticals so there is bangalore based company called manthan that targets only retail right so there are several several of those and and there's one example here the screenshot that shows you cdp is by their industry focus so that's another way then you can also categorize these vendors based on their support for specific use cases not all vendors cover all the use cases so that's an important criteria and finally you can categorize these vendors uh, uh, by their deployment approaches so so whether they allow in house do they allow Uh, on-premise uh, deployment do they allow saas based deployment and so on and so forth essentially by doing these kind of categorization you can actually bring down uh, bring down those 8000 or 80000 or whatever number of vendors there are to a much more manageable vendors that are relevant to you so we will not go through all these categorization but let's look at the first first two in slightly more detail so based on these functional categories here are some of, here are some of the key categories there's content and experience so essentially this category includes the products and tools that help you manage um, content for your website so 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 web content management system or digital asset management and media asset management systems that help you create digital and audio and video content for your for your digital media campaigns ad campaigns etc then you have social and relationships so uh, these are the tools that help you manage your social media presence so social media marketing would be an example monitoring social media for let's say doing a do, doing a sentiment analysis of tweets about about your product or about your brand then you have the products in the e-commerce category so products that let you do sales automation or products that let you build your own e-commerce website product information management uh, catalog management and so on and then there are products for advertising and promotion so products that let you do uh, advertising campaigns on social media on mobile on on, on print uh, doing doing pr type of activities and those those kind of functionality and then you have the marketing category uh, so this this really contains the technology that lets you do marketing campaigns email ca e email campaigns marketing automation uh, crm and so on and so forth now these are these are some of the categories that we have traditionally seen and they are not really new ones uh, several of them have existed for a long time the problem with this kind of a categorization model is that there is always going to be an overlap and 
overlap that results in a siloed model right so you might have uh, a social media marketing product that works on the same user base that let's say a marketing auto automation tool needs to work on and hence you need to be able to tie these five categories together to make up for a better omni channel experience and that's where these two new categories come in these are data and planning so these are categories that uh, that have uh, that have really emerged as very popular in past uh, couple of years and growing at a very very fast pace in particular data category is one where we are seeing a lot of interest in marketers and it consists of uh, uh, several categories but we will look at some of the key sub categories within data these are data platforms uh, so platforms that allow you to build a unified profile of your users so if your users come to you through different uh, 10 or 15 channels you are able to map them to a single user so that's what cdps do and cdps do this with help of platforms like data management management platform dmps uh, and it's their data and, and essentially you get a single user profile there are other functionality also that data platforms do but this is this is really the key functionality now once you have a unified profile you want to be able to manage your users journey across all these channels so you need platforms for for managing their journeys for doing personalization sort of an atc for your customers air traffic control for your customers so manage their journey so you have these decisioning platforms then you want to be able to analyze what your customers are doing so you have analytics platforms so dashboards a journey analytics and those kind of tools and since you are collecting so much of your information from your customers your your users you need to have tools that let you do things like consent management data governance privacy and with the new data privacy rules coming up in india uh, i think this is going to be a big area for you especially in india and then for planning you have the tools for for campaign planning so you don't want to be going to a marketing automation and creating a plan or a calendar there and then going to a social media campaign tool and creating another calendar there so you need tools that can work across channels and finally you have the management sub category there that lets you do administration and monitoring of of, of the health of your tools and so on and so forth so these are not all the sub categories but i think these are the key categories that you need to look at when you are building uh, building your building your stack and uh, jared has a good session on building martech stack and i recommend that uh, you you attend that session for some very good inputs on how to go about building your omni channel marketing stack okay so we have seen there are 8000 products in that in that landscape and i said that there are many more right so this question keeps coming up i have already licensed salesforce or ibm do i still need to look at these 8000 uh, products so replace salesforce with ibm or oracle or any digital experience platform or marketing cloud or or, or suites or, or or what have you right so this question keeps coming up and there are essentially two approaches to building your your martech stack so on the right is a screenshot of uh, how you Uh, how how usps has built their marketing stack so it shows you their key requirements uh, on this frame and then you see the products that they have used for each of those uh, those requirements so this is a good uh, visualization the other approach would have obviously been to use just one product say salesforce for all the requirements instead of using uh, individual tools now the point here is that these suite vendors some of the them at least can provide multiple solutions across different categories right so it can be an easy thing to actually go with one of those suite vendors license one of those big suite vendors or cloud providers or dxps as a solution for all your requirements martech requirements that seems like a that seems like a good deal right often customers believe that uh, such a solution solves their problem analysts and vendors push that notion too right but but we have seen that that doesn't really happen in real life uh, it is not necessary that a solution that provides or a vendor that provides many different solutions using the same product is is a better fit in fact a lot of times it actually turns out to be a bad fit a really bad one at that and the reason for that is that uh, most of these uh, sweet vendors 
have cobbled together their suites based on several acquisitions. Uh, as a result, their offering is not really a single tool in terms of user experience and architecture, but often a very badly cobbled together package of multiple tools, multiple products with varying provenance. Right, so essentially there is no such thing as an end-to-end -end solution or out-of-the-box platform. You really need to build your own MarTech stack, even if you were using, using a suite. So in case you do license a suite, keep these two things in mind. First, consider individual products in the suite based on its own merit and not because it's part of the suite. So for example, if you were going with, uh, let's say, Adobe CDP, right? Don't just go with Adobe CDP because you've, uh, you've already licensed Adobe's broader offerings, right? So, so compare Adobe CDP offering with other standalone CDP offerings and see if it, if it make, meets your requirements or not. And second point to keep in mind is that don't assume all the components of your suite or cloud are well integrated because they are not, right? So plan for additional effort and resources there. Right, so now back to landscapes. So how much time we've got? Okay, so so let's let's get back to landscapes, right? So we we looked at uh, Scott's uh, Scott land Scott's uh, landscape of eight thousand vendors. Uh, there are several more more landscape landscapes like that. So there are regional landscapes like this one from UK. Uh, we also have several others. So there is a Swedish land landscape. There's a German Martech landscape. Uh, there is a Canadian there. Uh, there is a there is a European there. I think there are a couple of more there. There is even a Chinese one, right? China has a Martech landscape map, and here's the Indian one. No, it doesn't exist, right? Right. So we want to create a India-specific Martech map. There are two reasons for that. One, obviously, that uh, uh, it doesn't exist, and second is essentially this, right? So why do we need an Indian one when there are so many global products? Do we need a separate one? And I think there are three aspects there. The first one is that we want to have a local innovation ecosystem. We want to encourage that, right? And having a having a catalog of Indian MarTech companies would help that. Uh, so a local presence of a company is very important because uh, as an end user, if I have somebody in my time zone, in my geography to help me when my site is down or my, my implementation is down, that's very useful. The global landscapes also miss several regional vendors. So that's another reason. Uh, we also want to be able to encourage local vendors. So, so vendors who don't get, who don't have a lot of marketing budgets to get published in, in, in large global landscapes. Uh, this will also create opportunities for talent, so people would know what are the other, other other possibilities for career progression and so on. And finally, this will help us uh, collaborate on local issues. So, so let's say talking to government bodies for 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 some some concessions or working on a Martech standard or something like that. The second key aspect here is that uh, having such a such a map will help us address the needs of. Indian marketers. So there are several India specific capabilities, right? So for example, cash on delivery is a very Indian phenomena and capturing real time cash on delivery data when a customer is picking up her, her package, I think that would be very relevant in an Indian scenario, whereas it may not be relevant in, in other geographies. In India, we also have different activation channels that are not really popular elsewhere. Right. So, so for example, WhatsApp is a big activation channel here. Also, Indian companies uh, find agency model uh, very, very helpful. So, a lot of times, it is the agency who is doing marketing for a brand, and hence that that makes it really, really different here. And finally, we want to be able to address the needs of Indian IT industry. Right. So, CIO, C CTOs. And a lot of Indian IT people prefer do DIY rather than packaged off the shelf solutions. Uh, there's also different focus here, right? So instead of marketers making decision, I, I think a lot of com at a lot of companies, decision is still taken by data science and engineering teams, uh, which may or may not be correct, but that, that's a different issue, but that, that, that has been reported here. 
Uh, then there are issues of localization. So Hindi is a big market. Other vernacular languages are a big market, and they are really untapped right now because uh, because global products are not looking at them. India specific pricing compliance. I think those are self-explanatory. Finally, scale. Right, the kind of population we have, and once we start using these tools for 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 regional languages, I think that scale is going to be unprecedented, and we really need. Uh, Uh, tools that understand the local context to be able to address that kind of scale so here's the plan um, for uh, for for releasing the map uh, we will release this india martech map by september uh, these are the initial co- collaborators alt view advisory ai props and exchange for media but we will welcome all contributions and we will give obviously due credits here's the link to the form uh, and uh, i will post it also somewhere so that you can easily access it so you can click on the form and uh, and submit your recommendations for the companies or vendors that should be included in in india martech map okay so that that's really it so this is this is uh, really the summary of uh, summary of uh, my presentation today Uh, there's a lot of tech out there uh, but you don't really need to look at everything uh, you need to be able to simplify it using different categorizations uh, second point is that uh, if anybody claims that they have a dxp or cxp or a martech or a or some other xy stack that provides an end to end solution be wary of those claims uh, you have to build such a solution it does not exist even if you license a suite or a marketing cloud you will need to build it and finally look out for the indian martech landscape uh, better still contribute to it thank so, you dr durga yes. uh, such a lovely discussion and you have given us the global perspectives on the martech uh, landscape and how india has a unique positioning in all the all of that mix what do you think anisha i mean uh, your initial thoughts on this discussion well um, uh, after listening to apurva it feels to me that the job of a cmo is uh, an exacting one you have to build your own stack one Absolutely. suit is not going to work for you uh, apurva if you still here there are a few questions that have come in now from uh, uh, some of our participants uh, apurva you there sure i am i'm here i have i've also got some questions here that people have sent uh, Yeah, so let me ask you. Uh, there is a question that is coming from Shakti at Grofers. Now, Shakti mm-hmm. uh, is asking, how does one track um, the new solutions that get launched on a daily basis? More than that, how do I know if it's going to work for me, my brand, my company? And should you try something new just because something new, something improved has come? How much time should you give for your own system and your stacks to work? Well, there are several questions there. right in that one question so so first thing is how do you keep track of this i i think there are some some really good uh, good resources out there you can you can go through let's say scott brinkers chiefmartech.com uh, website he blogs regularly about that you can you can follow the real story group blog you can also follow other analyst firms that real that regularly track this space so there are several resources on the web that you You might want to follow in order to be able to keep up with the. Of course, there is my blog as well, but but I am not going to put that here right now, right? So there are several resources out there that uh, that track new 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 emerging technologies, new emerging vendors. They write about those technologies in in details, and uh, and you can you can follow them. No, but now, how do you know it's going to work for you? Yeah, Whether it's yours is outdated. So, Yeah, can, absolutely. Uh, Apurva, so, can you so, just turn on your screen so that we can see you? We've seen your presentation. Now, can we see you on my screen? My screen should be on. I don't know why it, it oh, keeps going off. Oh, now we see off. you. Yes, now we see you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, so how does it work for you? I, I think th- there is only one way to do that, and that is to actually try it out. Most of these solutions provide some sort of a demo, or a lot of solutions provide provide a fourteen-day evaluation version, a demo version. Uh, if they don't they will they will be more than happy to give you a give you a demo at at your convenience so so feel free to ask those vendors for for a demo and that is that is really the only way to get your hands dirty and and find out if it works for you or not there there's nothing nothing else that will that will convince you whether it will work or work for you 
or not the point here is that every customer has completely different requirements and what works works for me may not work for you right so the only way for you to find out is by actually trying it out right dr durga in uh, during your presentation you also spoke about uh, that india has a unique agency model that works here you know unlike other markets you know it's pretty prominent here in india so i have a right. question from one of the agency uh, you know representatives he's asking uh, mr venkat from dentsu is asking are there enough homegrown solutions as far as martech is concerned uh, i think yes there are and we will find out more about it when we actually release this map but i think uh, we know a lot of vendors small vendors where where a lot of innovation is happening so especially in the areas of ai and application of ai to martech so there are vendors but uh, but maybe not as much as in, in in the us but there are certainly good amount of vendors in india who are not usually covered in in the analysis analyst reports and and so on right right Right. Uh, so, so in the end, it's not. It's never going to be a hundred percent made in India stack, right? That that's not going to happen, right? And right. I'm not even saying that. But the idea is that if there are Indian vendors and they are good, they should get visibility, and that that's really the objective. Thank you, Dr. Durga. We have a lot of questions, but we are out of time. And uh, thank you so much for this insightful uh, keynote. Lots to learn. Yes. What you, Anisha? In fact, okay, uh, you know, uh, they, they, building your stack is not easy, and there are a lot of solutions there. So, uh, Apurva has given us broad outlines on how to go about it. Uh, but let's move on. Next, we have a panel discussion on the marketing technologies India needs. Now, a country as diverse and large as India, with many states, different cultures, and languages, it requires marketers to think out of the box. now post the corona pandemic outbreak most people are you know stocking up on essentials rather than splurging on luxurious or discretionary items naturally if i am uh, you know searching on the latest study on how the virus spreads or the numbers in my city the likelihood of me spending on a lipstick or a luxury holiday is very low so what should marketers of discretionary products do should they go off the radar for some time lie low does that mean when you come back and you want to build a relationship or a brand recall for your customers uh, that is going to be counterproductive what marketing is going to look like post in the uh, in the post corona virus world this is what we're going to discuss in the next panel discussion and uh, we also will try to understand what are the marketing technologies that work more effectively in india than some of the others do and we try to get a bit of comparison between india and some of the other markets as well So uh, I'm happy to introduce the panelist who will be uh, speaking on this panel. We have Mr. Anil Shrinivas Chila. He's a Chief Digital and a Data Officer of L'Oreal. He's a growth-oriented business leader with 20 years of experience with 11 plus years in digital transformation across multiple growth markets. We also have uh, Mr. Prabhakar Tiwari, the CMO of Angel Broking. Now um, he has been spearheading brand performance and PR initiatives for Angel Broking, and the firm has seen rapid improvements in its digital majority metrics. So we're going to speak to him about uh, uh, his journey and what he foresees in the post-pandemic uh, era. We also have Anika Agarwal, the CMO of uh, Max Bupa. Uh, who will be with us in this panel discussion she is a seasoned marketing professional and she joined Max Bupa in 2011 as the head of uh, the marketing function she is responsible for the over, overall brand strategy and marketing marketing communications of the brand i would like to welcome all three of you uh, on this discussion Hello, everyone. thanks for joining us Hi, uh, everyone uh, so uh, Hi, everyone. let me let me start uh, with um, anil uh, you know uh, you know the brand l'oreal has a wide recall now at a time when people perhaps are not you know focusing too much on uh, spending on you know non essentials what should l'oreal do i mean we know you have a brand ambassador we know you have awesome, awesome products at this point on i'm just not thinking about this so uh, what will you do will you save your pennies on your marketing would you then re envisage your marketing to somehow you know connect with the emotions your prospective customers feeling may maybe it's anxiety maybe it's stress but you want to somehow connect with them so that your brand stays there without you know trying to push them towards uh, a purchase which they may not be ready for now 
Yeah, I mean, um, the short answer to that is all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but you know what I mean we we are thought of as a makeup company but we've mm-hmm. got you know uh, uh, we are the largest you know hair color company you know in in uh, in, in the world and in, in, in India you know we've got a great portfolio of hair color products we've got hair care shampoos conditioners serums etc we've mm-hmm. obviously got skin care products and then makeup and then we've got the luxury part of the business which focuses on you know uh, you know the premium you know uh makeup skin care etc etc right so yeah so and and then of course a big salon business etc uh, uh the point essentially being that you know only the makeup part is what probably is not at the top of mind at this point in time but people are certainly focused on you know their own personal care well being health hmm. uh you know wellness uh, etc right so which falls uh, pretty much squarely in uh, in 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 the areas that we work on right so especially in the hair care hair color etc categories so for us you know we we've, we've sort of focused uh, pivoted our focus right so we are obviously a beauty company a beauty tech mm-hmm. company as we like to call ourselves uh, and we have sort of pivoted our focus on the categories which we all now know as essential and sort of going you know in, into you know uh, whether it's in terms of a go to market whether it's in terms of a uh, digital marketing whether it's in terms of you know commercial excellence etc and e-commerce obviously we've sort of focused on the categories which are uh, at this point what we would call essential and then you know once consumers are in the state of mind you know to look at uh, broader things they start going out etc is when we start focusing on you know categories such as makeup etc part one of your uh, question mm-hmm. part two is i think you know we you know as as a part of this you know overall uh, i'd say unfortunate situation around covid 19 you know i think it's it's impacting pretty much everyone right uh, mm. a- across the world whether it's you know people companies countries you know you name it economies etc right the point essentially being there that you know we we also you know sort of undergone a, a sort of a uh you know a uh, 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 transformation internally and how we approach it right so you know whether it's global or whether it's in 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 the market in india we obviously you know looked at uh, what works uh, within this market what kind of messaging uh, etc and we are trying to you know resonate understand uh, basically from a consumer's perspective what's really important and make sure you know we are sort of addressing that rather than you know being a push 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 Mm-hmm. rather it should be you know from consumer perspective what's important at this point in time therefore you know sort of look at it all right uh, prabhakar i want to come to you now uh, you know uh, at this time people are stuck at home and uh, you know uh, companies like yours who are in the fintech space have already been a little ahead of the curve if i can say that uh, uh, when it comes to product you already have your apps you already uh, you know are doing a lot you integrated your payments everything and you have an app that is really uh, making it easier for people to come to your platform to invest uh, to uh, to to trade or whatever but uh, um, at this point of time when there is some panic and there is some uncertainty is this a time for you to your people saying that you know you can get great results or is this a time for you to build a brand association for the long term and how are you doing it as opposed to your competitors okay, okay first of all uh, thanks a lot for exchange for media team you know to for this panel discussion and thanks anisha for your question uh see i think uh, very very interestingly put of course as a bfsi business we were ahead of curves in case of angel broking we have 30 years of our history behind us and particularly last 4 years we have done a lot of work for digital transformation mm-hmm. and uh, it it paid off beautifully you know since march the lockdown started mm-hmm. so tell me, uh, let me tell you that uh, since march for 3 months we had average uh, customer acquisition of around 1 lakh per month 1 lakh plus you know that's mm-hmm. very very high number so what do you attribute that to prabhakar why no. anisha i would love to do that you know but uh, i must say that this has happened because of of course cus- change in customer behavior and second mm-hmm. of course our readiness and of course our advertising and marketing campaigns mm-hmm. so lot of uh, interest we saw in terms of organic 
like people are spending more time hmm. reading about your brand or trying to go through your website pages hmm. and uh, once they become interested there is a customer diy journey which hmm. doesn't have any uh, physical interface hmm. so they can go through the entire journey and open a demat account uh, i mean theoretically speaking that is possible within 5 minutes but there is a hard verification and couple of other steps that may come in the way otherwise within 5 minutes it's possible for people to open demat account and within 15 minutes they can start doing trading Mm-hmm. so because of this reason which is the customer interest they were log- logged up in the home they have plenty of time to explore uh, they could actually uh, they always have had interest in stock market but they mm-hmm. never found the time to explore now they could explore at home mm-hmm. and in march there was a sudden fall in the stock market like mm-hmm. in a matter of days the stocks were low as low as 30% like, yeah 30% you are so right so so these stocks were in multi year lows you are sitting at home and you have opened the demat account and then you start investing mm-hmm. okay so not only we saw a great rush in mm-hmm. opening demat account but we also saw a rush in starting trading mm-hmm. so take for example usually what we call day 0 day 1 mm-hmm. like post opening demat account if day 0 day 1 only 10% people trade mm-hmm. that number went to as high as 25% okay so two and half percent jump uh, two and half times jump on that also mm-hmm. now coming back to your question is this uh, mm-hmm. time to lure customer or is it time to build Bill a long brand okay yeah. now if you look at angel broking you know uh, last year we went in uh, kind of uh, flat brokerage mm-hmm. okay so we are a mm-hmm. full service brokerage house mm-hmm. with a research and advisory team best in class and now we are available at brokerage prices as low as any discount broker out there okay and what we call it aage badhne ka smart sauda okay mm-hmm. so somewhere idea is not to lure them mm-hmm. because we But have to offer them value but offer them value and why is it long term because you know i mean uh, you just opening a demat account uh, doesn't give me any revenue mm-hmm. and neither you uh, buying stock for the first time doesn't give me revenue what gives me revenue is that whatever investment you are making you are able to see growth in that mm-hmm. and that makes you keep investing again and again and that's where we make money as a, as as an as a, as a brokerage house so somewhere right. i think we have tried to balance both you know in terms of uh, educating them and also keeping them engaged with us so that's you know my two bits on what you asked right so uh, anika i want to ask you you know when everybody is panicked and oh there's a pandemic let's buy insurance you know that's the first thing that's going to come to anybody's mind but you know when the dust settles and uh, people go back to doing other things how are you going to keep that to call when there's panic you know pushing things on their on their social media on the facebook it's not that tough right but right. how much in road have you made during this time that even later people will come back to you when things seem normal and they will still value your product what strategies have you applied now what are the channels you think that work most effectively for you sure thanks anisha and prabhakar i love your background <laughs> takes us back to the original june so thank you for that uh coming back to us uh, anisha i think what we've done is that we've broken this into three parts the first is that you know what do we do really within this pandemic period mm-hmm. and we have a very different problem or a good i shouldn't say good problem but a, a different situation mm-hmm. ours is a category where people usually don't have time to spend on they will come and say oh insurance is something that i have to buy and it's always mm. at the back and not something it's a cost nobody I... wants to make correct so you have a situation where customers are coming to you and saying that you know i need to buy insurance mm. but you also have two other phases after that one is the first phase when you know immediately when they come out of this pandemic phase mm. what will they do and from a medium to long term view what can you do for the brand and the business mm. So first uh, when we speak about the pandemic I think yes there is a big rush to uh, buy insurance right now mm. what we have got advantage of is that what we were getting ready in terms of customer revolution and customers coming in buying digitally mm. access mm. to data that's coming in handy mm. what we are also doing is that we are also trying to utilize the trust that the customers had on the brand right so this mm. is the real time when customers really value what you've built as a brand and you milk it and you say that you know hey i am a brand that you've trusted for a period of time mm. and in these times of pandemic you buy me but beyond that what we're also doing in this period is to actually create brand trust for future 
so while there is you know a, a, a part of marketing which is focusing on selling and you know helping customers buy the right insurance products mm -hmm. we are also saying that at this point in time we will do three things as a brand we will provide them access to healthcare and when we say access to healthcare it is the right healthcare whether it is hospitals or whether it is healthcare at home also so a lot of play around adjacent categories you know insurance is mm. typically bought to pay for hospital yeah. uh, coverage but today many people cannot go to a hospital right i need a doctor mm. on a video call for example yes. so we are enabling adjacent categories uh, for that customer trust to build for future so we are providing access we are providing information right now because you know in this world uh, that's a big premium you know everybody is saying this drug has come it will do this hospitals mm. are cheating you you know rates have grown Gone manifold up. yeah yeah so a lot of information that you provide at this time uh, will help uh, seed you as a brand which takes care of the customer beyond just paying for the policy mm. and the third is that with the martech stack that we have already mm. built we are finding new ways of engagement so when we talk about customer engagement and communication it is more about what did i experience at this time when i was with you to spread word of mouth so when you look at our martech stacks and we've spoken about it and in the last presentation i heard the fact that you know it's so tough to build your own data yeah. stack but yeah. how important and critical it is so i think at max bupa at least for us we were on that journey for the last 2 years okay. so the fact that you have your own data which is transactional mm. you also have a lot of you know digital identity data of the customer that we get mm. but you know we also encourage a lot of uh, zero party data coming in customers actually giving us their own information so okay. we spoke you know we speak about the role of iot in categories like ours we mm. use iot to encourage the customer to actually give us their health information and access mm. which helps us to personalize and customize so analytics is working for you now i have one question for all of you and i'll i'll give you examples now uh, i can always buy lipstick online on it but i like to walk into a store and try it out i don't want to risk the shade and the texture and everything prabhakar i like my broker to call me and tell me uh, what is coming up with the rights issue or, or something like that and anika when i buy an insurance i feel more safe more relief if i'm talking to a agent okay. if i have a problem i will call him if i have a claim i will call him now in this pandemic this one on one has disappeared so what is your strategy now you will revert to a strategy where you will have a points person or do you think habits will change so much that you might as well work in a model where there is you know there is a connect but not a physical one there is trust without a person what is your strategy I, i'll one by one if prabhakar you can go first okay so uh, you know I, as i shared with you that you know we started the digital transformation journey 4 years back okay so last year apart from changing our pricing you know we changed our business model so rather than having uh, field force uh, during acquisition phase we started with a telecaller so okay. you know, face to face interaction we moved to a telecaller mm -hmm. and while we had a diy journey available we upgraded the upgraded the diy journey today i can tell you for at least for the online the diy journey is as high as 32 to 35 percentage that's okay. a high percentage so customer come they follow the 6 7 steps of filling the forms and all and they kind of open their dmat account right so mm. that's on the acquisition phase now coming to the service and revenue side where mm. once you have become a customer you need to be educated you need to be told you know mm. that these are various segments future yes. options intraday you need to buy that stock this stock platinum advisory and all of that there also we are encouraging more and more that our app should be so intuitive the experience should be so interesting and the knowledge point should be so available that customer can choose things on their own because mm -hmm. while some people still like to call broker but mm -hmm. many a time some miss selling may happen right because you are not observing that interface while our yes. apis are more towards customer doing their own uh, kind of mm -hmm. trading mm -hmm. but maybe because of human element something can happen right so the point i want to make is that irrespective of the covid 19 our focus was to become a very mass retail player mm. today we are in uh, uh, top 2 in terms of market share of new dmat account opening and in terms of active client we are number 5 where we want to be number 3 so we believe we will make a very sizable business model 
hmm. where our entire focus would be that customer can do their own journey on hmm. our platform not hmm. just during acquisition phase but also during revenue phase so somewhere you know we are not too bothered about giving a human face or making a okay. human connect right so for angel that journey is already started anil how about you yeah so uh, for us uh, you know we've been in this uh, digital transformation journey for the last few years right so mm-hmm. um, uh, as a part of the overall you know transformation again you know referring to the point earlier where i said we are a beauty tech company uh, two years back we acquired a you know a, a company which is uh, called modiface modiface is into uh, augmented reality virtual okay. reality mm. uh, it basically you know allows for the use case that you were describing right yes. so where, you can try it out at home and exactly, see yourself exactly on you know on an app uh, mm. on a website or at the pos counter you know at the counter if you don't want to touch anything mm. you can have an ipad look at it and you know just apply various shades of uh, lipstick or compact or you know uh, mascara or whatever right whatever beauty product that you're looking for so uh, in that sense uh, even you know going to hair color hair mm. shades mm. Uh, shades of color uh, etc so et how long have you have this and what's been the response during this time oh it's been brilliant right so uh, as as a as a product it's been brilliant for our uh, for a company we've sort of deployed it across the globe in india mm-hmm. we now have it live across our websites we are, we will be you know we are looking to go live talking to our uh, e-commerce partners okay. and then you know at the peers counters as well right so that's one part of the journey really in terms of contactless fully digital uh, interface as far as this is concerned you know uh, the transaction or the one to one is concerned there's also a big part of the business that we are famous for which is called which is part of the salons right mm. uh, the hair salons right so hair salons for us is is ex- extremely important as well right so so again you know there we have uh, a, an app called uh, style my hair uh, which mm. is again you know powered through uh, modiface where customers can check out different hairstyles different shades of color etc and then what we you know just started you know with uh, with our uh, as a response to uh, covid because no one wants to go to a salon etc mm. right so uh, we've started social commerce with our salons right where your hair stylist you know knows what you know what what you want what kind of products you're looking for you can't obviously visit the salon but then the products can come to your home right <laughs> so uh, the stylist is uh, will reach out to you and to you okay yeah exactly right. and connects with so, you and yeah so after talking to uh, prabhakar and anil it seems that this is a strategy which is not reactive to what has happened now but has been in play for some time so anika for you is uh, do you feel the customer going ahead has enough trust to just go through your website and make a purchase and not get back to an advisor are you playing for that in the future absolutely i think the path to purchase will change fundamentally for the for our category and you will see more and more people getting the comfort but as some of my colleagues said we'll also build in solutions which give them that comfort so you know whether it's a video advisor or whether it's an advisor always available that will be there but also for your agent advisors if they st- they'll still play a fundamental part right human touch will not go away and especially for us indians what we're also using this period and time is for giving enough data and information uh, about the customers to our agents so you know when i come to you i know more about you and there is there is a more personalized offering in place for you okay and once you know you have a touch going forward how do we really go forward and almost have no human touch with that customer once the first trust and buzz first touch is established okay. so th- there'll be a play of both anish okay All right. I would like to thank all of you for taking the time out and sharing with us your experiences uh, and how uh, you are adapting your marketing strategies to the post-COVID world. Anika, Prabhakar, Ranil, thank you so much for being with us uh, on uh, the Martech India Bridge uh, Conference. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank, thank you. For- thank you, Anisha. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, Anisha, for this. Uh, we have up next a very interesting conversation coming up uh, with Aparna Mahesh, CMO Bank Bazaar, and uh, the discussion that we will have with her. Uh, we will be asking you and I will be asking those questions: is how to build brand resilience to combat disruptions. And if you see right now, we have faced the most disruptive phase uh, ever. You know. i mean um, everyone is like coming to terms with this and there's no strategy in place there was no thinking it was not expected so how do we deal with these sudden disruptions that is the discussion we'll have 
um, so we could begin. If you have a presentation uh, in the beginning, we can start with that or later on, up and now. No, I'm just going to uh, talk you through some of the points. Um, okay. I don't have a ready-made presentation. Right. So, so uh, Aparna, a quick uh, introduction about your company. Now, uh, yours is an online marketplace for instant customized great quotes on loans and credit cards. And uh, you, you can shop for loans, cards, or anything one wants online. It's, it's like an Amazon for the bank uh, loan rates, etc. Now, uh, the, the first question that pops to my mind is, uh, can you tell us what is the extent of change that you have seen, say, from uh, during this period, which is like April, May, uh, March, April, May, as compared to a year ago? Now, you have been operating for some time and this marketplace is, has been around. How have things changed for you in the last one year, if you look at these three months? Sure. I'll just make a small correction. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not just about loan rates. Uh, we are you a can make marketplace a purchase for financial yeah. So you can go ahead, make your application, you know, and we match you with the right products and you can go right ahead and apply. And so that's, that's, we work the entire. So um, I heard one of the speakers earlier talk about the fact that it's not like they opened up their digital strategy just post COVID. Yes. I think it's been pretty much the same with us. I think uh, the, uh, the, the company has been, you know, we are a 12 year old company mm. and our vision has been to match people with the right a financial product in a secure manner and in a paperless manner. Okay. Uh, a lot of the bank when you have to open an account today, be it for a credit card or for a personal loan, mm. still has a large number of offline processes, right? You've got to, mm. it involves meeting with a bank representative, signing off photocopied documents, handing it over. Mm. So while for the last 10 years or so, we've been working uh, with a technology to try and make this as seamless and paperless as possible. I think mm -hmm. what we're seeing right now, the writing is on the wall. Mm -hmm. People want contactless solutions, right? Mm -hmm. So anything that you can access within the comfort and the security of your own home, mm -hmm. you know, be it your groceries, be it any kind of service. And definitely now when it comes to your own financial services, they don't want to step out. They don't want to meet anyone. They definitely uh, don't want to walk into a, a bank branch. Mm. I think that um, uh, I that even prior to COVID, we were hitting very, very high numbers in okay. terms of digital finance demand, right? People want, I mean, the rest of your life, you're getting everything that you want. You're tapping your, your phone and everything is coming to you. So why would you hold back when it comes to the financial products that you want? Mm. Right? So mm. I think the demand was building up. Uh, currently, what we're seeing is, I don't want to meet a bank rep. I don't want to do any of that. Can this product be delivered to my phone uh, contactlessly? So I think that has been a huge shift that we've seen. See, eventually the world moved contactless for everything, whether it's communication today or commerce. And I think we're seeing the same when it comes to financial services as well. But, um, you know, uh, the question I had was, can you give us some numbers? Because, you know, uh, I... You know, we were just discussing that at this point of time, there's a lot of uncertainty. People are not sure about going ahead with the purchase. Even if I come and see, okay, rates are coming down. Uh, has conversion increased? Has traffic increased? So do you have some numbers to tell us how business has changed in these three months for you? So it's very early days. With financial products, it's a longer cycle eventually. Mm -hmm. But what I can tell you is uh, after the initial slowdown, um, what we are pushing now is a is a lot of video KYC uh, based uh, application with our partners. While earlier that was pretty much zero. Okay. So uh, what happened was in Jan 2020, uh, uh, made this really progressive move of allowing video KYC for onboarding uh, partners. And what earlier would have taken maybe a couple of quarters for it to become mainstream amongst. Uh, many of our partners, we're already seeing that a lot of banks, I'm sure you've been, if yeah. you're tracing this space, you know that uh, Indus Indus talked about it. Various banks have been talking about the fact that video KYC. So we are definitely seeing that there's a huge uh, uptick on, on in that particular space. The yeah. point is also that today, in with extreme uncertainty around people, there is a demand for liquidity. So definitely... Yeah loan to fund a big ticket purchase or a wedding or any of those which is why these loans were taken earlier they definitely mm -hmm. are liquidity whether these are salaried individuals or small businesses okay. How are they 
process this without actually going through the rigmarole of all the offline processes that we had in the past is what we are seeing building up the entire ecosystem i think i want to add that i think the entire ecosystem has had to sort of overhaul itself during lockdown ready to service this entirely contactless demand that has come post covid so it's a little early for us to share numbers honestly because most of april sort of you know we've been in a bit of a lull there's been the lockdown uh, people are figuring out a lot of other uncertainties in their life it's only now that we're slowly seeing some of these trends emerging i think we'll need to give it another 40 days at least right well i want to ask you a question that you know banking is a very sensitive sector you know finance i mean to say overall and uh, now uh, everything is online and building that trust you know those who were doing offline banking are still now going online but they are very new to it right now so how do you build that trust that you know it's safe environment they always had these these concerns so as an evangelist of online marketplace in finance how are you ensuring to build that trust factor in new consumers so i can tell you this bank bazaar has never been a very big media uh, uh, based brand i think when it comes to financial services building awareness is uh, barely scratching the iceberg right because where the customers are at when it comes to financial services even the most confident of customers is usually a little uncertain mm. a little undecided and wants to do a lot of research and wants some sort of uh, um, you know uh, expert advice if you will on whether they are doing the right thing or not over the last decade that we've been around we've definitely seen that the indian consumer has become more self reliant but at the end of the day if your brand has helped them in the past make the right decisions if you've helped them with the right tools with the right content for instance then that trust is something that has already probably been built with you and that is to leverage and get go from strength to strength from here on i'm not sure if this would be the right time for you to suddenly come in and start building trust uh it's a it's a fairly long drawn out process especially when it comes to something as sensitive as people's money um so i can talk a little bit about the fact that you know content marketing has been the the backbone of pretty much everything we've done till now uh for the last 10 years we've invested a significant amount of time energy and technology in just creating content because as i said every indian customer currently you know is looking for information for validation about their decision making choosing the right financial product and it based on that right we've seen that eventually you know they keep coming back because the stickiness is built and so they need to figure out what are the elements of trust that the financial services brand need to sort of work on uh, with your customers right 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 so aparna you said that content has been a big backbone for your success uh, in your marketing stack what else has worked in your favor has it been analytics how have you been able to personalize uh, the right uh, content for the right audience um, uh, how about data safety because you know these are sensitive things uh do you have a, a secure technology that brings in that uh, you know confidence in doing that transaction on your site what has worked from you, for you in your stack what would you rate is the top 3 things that has made it work for back bazaar so techno i mean we're a fintech company you can't take the tech out of fintech hmm. um eventually i mean what we've done over the last 10 or so years is essentially make sure that we are leveraging technology through the entire customer journey every part of it so when i talk about acquisition acquiring you this content which has been the okay. predominant strategy that we follow and as i said we put in significant investment in terms of teams as well as in terms of technology to just be able to disseminate the amount of content that we create to our own base as well as new customers hmm. what happens when you acquire customers on the back of very deep financial content is that they already come in with an element of trust towards this brand hmm. you know it's not they haven't just come in because hey this brand made an interesting ad me they're all about they come in saying hey these guys had an interesting point of view on you know how much of my income i'm putting in an sip or hmm. how much i invest once they come in the journey begins now for a fintech as a category how do you build stickiness you're not like an e-commerce company where people can come back and you can keep you know feeding their impulses to keep coming back so 
So what we have is essentially there are two pillars to build this sort of skin. One is our credit score program that we run with Experian. Um, this has become a huge success. financial literacy has sort of grown in india we're seeing that the numbers of uh, people we've seen 111% growth in the number of customers that come back and check their credit scores on bank mm-hmm. bazaar so mm-hmm. just imagine the kind of numbers we're talking about we have 40 million registered customers today we do traffic of about 30 million a month these are so if there's 111% growth in the people coming to check their credit and what we know is a large part of these people come every month to check their credit scores basically means that they want to stay top on top of their credit score they want to credit worthiness and about uh, a large chunk of these people are under the age of 40 so we've built a good sort of pipeline of customers as they make their way down their own financial journey the second part where we've leveraged technology really well is um via our mobile app where we essentially it's a it's a sophisticated personal finance management tool which sort of helps you stay on top of not just your credit score but also keep up with your payments sort of have a good sense of where your finances are at so these are what we have leveraged a significant amount of technology on towards building stickiness and of course you know helping customers in their financial journey let's now come to the marketplace itself that's the third point that i would talk about it long partnerships with the leading banks and nbfcs mm. in the country right so what products for pretty much every kind of customer uh what we've been able to do very successfully uh, by leveraging machine learning is that very quickly able to match the right financial product with the right customer in a matter of minutes okay now when you're talking about who have you know who are extremely impatient even when it comes to financial services and they're dropping off the funnel they're you know happy to drop very quickly we are able to leverage this sort of intel that we have and hold them through the entire customer journey mm-hmm. right so we do that it's because we have a single view of this customer with all the data that we have over the years so that at every stage we are able to sort of nudge them i would say these are some of the big uh, uh big programs that have really worked for us uh, get to where we are right i mean i have a question you know tech has become the dominant conversation of course before even covid you know covid is not the beginning of tech you know as many people will keep asking that you know it's an online push but it's been there for a long time but tell me when it comes to deciding the what goes into a stack is it the cmo the cto or the entire management you know how does it work you know who decides what i mean how does it just just kind of an curious so you know startups are extremely sort of democratic not very hierarchical at all but in this case given the intense amount of sensitivity along around this and the fact that there are a ton of regulations in place this would be something that would be uh, taken uh, the decisions on this would happen very closely between the product team and the technology team of course and the entire senior management signing off on it as well right 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 uh, parna you spoke about um, uh, video content for your customers see i think what's worked for you is good content and uh, your brand uh, resilience has been built by the fact that you used your machine learning to customize it to the uh, uh, to each of your customer according to the data you have now what is the next frontier you spoke about video what is next now if we have your your traffic is so high what is the next thing you have to build on so that you keep your customer and get more so as i said earlier i think the brave new frontier is contactless entirely contactless finance which basically means 100% end to end digital checkout without meeting a single person without handing over a single document mm-hmm. this is already something that we are working very closely with us to sort of enable video kyc as i said is a very very progressive move by the rbi mm-hmm. and i think uh, it was completely sort of uh, it just arrived prior to this covid uh, uh, blow up that has happened and mm-hmm. it couldn't have been more timely than it actually has been and we are already you know working so currently our short term focus definitely is going to be working with all our partners to get this enabled for all of their products because mm. hey offline is going to struggle this is something that we are hearing from all of our partners mm. look at the situation of our big cities you know there are lockdowns we open up 
thing full of lockdowns happening again it's mm-hmm. going to be very difficult for people for the dsas to to go collect documents at this point there's a lot of uncertainty looming large so mm-hmm. at this point you know for growth i think the enabler is going to be uh, digital kyc uh, and, and that is where our focus will be uh, from here on right right so right. that brings me to the security point again you know uh, it's really nice that rbi is allowing video but uh, you know uh, how do you sign digitally if you if you don't have a verified digital signature um, how do you know that a payment made uh, on your site is absolutely secure in a in a world where cyber attacks are increasing so what are the security features uh, that you have already and is that also a frontier that you're looking to reinforce going ahead so absolutely i think uh, video kyc the rbi uh, requires that Uh, a bank of essentially validate and sign off right so that is absolutely mandatory the second thing is that given that we're talking about loan applications credit card applications there isn't really a payment involved mm-hmm. in terms of verifying identity verifying address and ver- verification of the customer uh, mm-hmm. kyc so uh, at all times you know we are uh, sort of ensuring that we maintain all the uh, security that has been prescribed by uh, by partners by the rbi uh, mm-hmm. and uh, as i every customer currently it is mandated that it this is verified by uh, a bank representative so that is the process in place currently it's mm-hmm. it's extremely safe okay right but right. upon i want to come in from an uh, communication and mock mock in communication point of view you know this is also a tough phase emotionally for consumers and brands it's not just the normal phase tell me uh, maintaining that uh, connect with consumers during these times how have you been uh, kind of doing it enabling that same emotional connect with your brand you know despite you know a lot of things are happening in the back end could you take us through that a little bit of that story absolutely you can imagine um the consumer has been going through different waves of extremely mm. strong emotions when it all started you know there was the shock for a while with everyone trying to figure out and some sense of it and now as we realize that this is the new reality i think the consumer sort of is moving through different stages uh, as you rightly said i think emotional sucker is something that they're looking for uh, but i think when it comes to their finances they're also looking for brands to help them uh make sense of this help them with the decisions mm. that their term future is going to depend upon so again you know i will come back to what we do in financial services at least initially all about putting out enough ensuring that we were communicating with all of our stakeholders whether it's the employees whether it's with the partners whether it's with our customers uh with the customers it's all about these are the things that you need to be worrying about your finances currently right so what is it that you need to do in terms of your savings what is it that you need to do in terms of investments what about insurance what do you do about loans the customer today is being hammered with all kinds of updates right we have the rbi regular coming out updates so the first thing that customers need to know is how does this apply to me moratorium do i not what happens when i do that right so at least initially we put out a lot around some of these movements that were happening which were likely to impact them now we've even gone deeper because it's it's much more than just saying hey focus on your cash focus on your investments it's about helping people with very tangible problems about do i continue with my si or do i you know do i do any emi you know these are real problems that people are facing today do i pay my premium or do i repay my emis do i take the moratorium what do i do you know so this is our content strategy right now has you know we've been working over time the amount of content that we've put out currently just in terms of very specific bites in terms of this or that uh how to manage your finances in this sort of a situation what do you do when it comes to insurance in this sort of a situation if you've been laid off and you don't have health insurance what do you do so i think it's all been around i think information as i said with finance it's always about uh, even at the best of time is about seeking information these are you could say the worst of times or definitely the most volatile of times it's been about sort of hand holding customers giving them the the information for them to navigate these these paths as they take certain decisions about their finances we are them in the near term as well as in the long term Right. right. So, so but now, back to content. So I I wanted to understand how do you do this? I mean, uh, 
Uh, is it machine learning? Is it analytics? What is the suite that is working for you? Because obviously you have data of a lot of customers, but you are uh, customizing it in real uh, in real terms in uh, real time. You know, if the RBI has come out with a new with a moratorium. This is something new. You have forty million customers with different data. How have you customized, uh, uh, you know, the solutions that you're offering them? What has worked for you here? So um, over the years, we have a fairly good sense of what are the broad concerns that customers are likely to have mm -hmm. uh, given certain movements in the market. I think this is intelligence that has been built over time. Okay. So, uh, and we also, because we, uh, you know, essentially we uh, are specialists in the credit side of things, right? So with mm -hmm. credit cards, personal loans, etc. So the first thing that we know the people are going to, I mean, it's, it's at the end of the day, understanding customer behavior and psychology. Mm -hmm. It is basically the RBI says there's a moratorium. The starting point is, Put yourself in their shoes. You know that this is the question that's coming to your mind. So we always start at a high level saying moratorium. This is what it means. This is what you will be hit with, you know. And if you need to take the moratorium, this is what you need to do. So we we sort of were among the first that started talking about a bounce back. Because mm. there's no denying that you may need to take a moratorium. But if you've taken it, how do you bounce back and get back to the point that you were pre-COVID? Hmm. Um, so these are, you know, these are all learnings that we've had over the years uh, to sort of guide us to understand that this is the large profile of customers that we have. These are likely to be their concerns. The second thing is that um, when I talk about content, we disseminate a lot of content through the leading publications in the country. Hmm. So we are in constant touch with the editors at all of these publications. Okay. We know the kind of queries that are coming their way. We know uh, what the pulse is. And based on that, we customize a lot of our content for that as well. So okay. it starts at a high level saying, hey, these are likely to be the top questions. And then we go deeper and deeper based on what we hear from the ground. Um, so that's pretty much how we go. So when we talk about moratorium, we don't content about that for about two weeks, three weeks. When the second, when the moratorium was extended further, we continue to write a little bit more about that. So mm -hmm. that's essentially the life cycle of content around any of these events that happen. Right. So uh, I have, we have five minutes more. So I have one question. Uh, as uh, the head or as a leader, you know, who, who is running Bank Bazaar's, you know, strategy, marketing strategy, tell me what are the key learnings from this uh, the last 90 days, if I may ask you these, this, some key learning. So always, I think the first favorite, which is that digital is here to stay. And I don't think anyone needs to question that uh, mm -hmm. anymore. Um, I think, now it's uh, proven. Sorry? Now it's proven. I mean, now everyone it's is proven. Convinced. Absolutely. So uh, that's happened. I think it's about, uh, um, I'll break this into two. I think internally with the teams, when you Teams, and you understand that this is a the human side of it is essentially it's important for everyone to sort of stay calm and you know um, figure this out in a very rational and sensible manner. The end of the day, we operate the space, and and one has to be extremely. So I think it's about looking at the immediate short term and then looking at eventually the long term as fold. Um, as I said, I think you know it's it's clearer now than ever before that uh, digital is the way forward. And you know, we are very excited about uh, the the journey that lies ahead uh, for all of us in this space. Right, right. Well, one last question from my side, then Anisha. Um, if you, I mean, Bank Bazaar has this uh, history of staying ahead of competitors, you know, you have created that kind of a brand, you know, when it was COVID or not COVID, you still have that advantage. How did you maintain, how do you maintain this? How do you make it work, you know, consistently that, you know, you stay ahead in this game? So I think, you know, it's a little bit of everything that I've already covered. It is essentially understand what your customers want. And when it comes to financial services, customers in India, their requirements are very, very different. We've, had, we've seen two different generations of people entering the workforce and they each come with their own set of, uh, of and so, so guide them, you know, there's no need to sort of uh, uh, educate them, give them enough information, empower them. I think that's super important. Second is, I think the product, I mean, unless the product is fantastic, unless that experience for the customer when they come there and they're looking for a personal finance product and they're matched with the absolute uh, 
you know the right and the most relevant products for them i think that that pretty much is something that we constantly work to stay on top of uh because there is really no substitute to that and eventually as i said through all of the technology that we've been able to leverage i think we are able to bring back our retained retention rate by our repeat customers are extremely high so we are able to bring it to the fold and that's how we've been able to grow largely organically uh, through the entire uh, uh, life span of the brand if if i may say so right, right. Uh, so aparna uh, going ahead you told us video is important but what has helped uh, with the resilience of the brand your your content is really strong but what has endured you to your customer that you know even going ahead even if you know things change this is a thing he wants to do what, what how have you built the brand resilience see i think it's about how do you delight the customer at every touch point when the customer comes in right whether it's whether he's looking for information on personal loans and you've given him so much of information that he's simply delighted and he says hey i've got everything that i needed to know to make up my mind i think that is something we've continued to do the second is eventually quickly you know today's customer is in a hurry you know they want everything uh, delivered to them very very quickly so once you know the customer have you been able to match him to the right product have you been able to sort of uh, uh, help him especially with covid happening right now and they all about the stepping out and you know at the same time needing easy contactless access have you been able to help them do that i think those are focus areas for us and those are where i think we've been able to do pretty well right right before you go i want to ask you this question that you know this we have seen a spike in online transactions now people going online but once the things uh, start coming back to normal you know the vaccine comes in and everything else do you think what would remain you know what would be the advantage the take away for online players out of that do you think that the uh, spike will remain or will it go down to where it was are you prepared for that phase i mean how do you see that no i think you know the point that i mentioned earlier is on the demand side demand finance has was touching all time highs even pre covid right look at the consumer that we are talking about you know there there's, there's been a complete amazonification if you will of the service that we want why would we want it any differently when it comes to financial services so on the demand side i think it was there i think as i talked about it's the it's the ecosystem the requirements are uh, a lot of the processes continue to remain offline so i think current the boost that has happened because of video kyc and things like that i think that has risen up to meet the demand so i think it should it should pretty much stay uh, where it is and only go higher and higher from here all right aparna thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us uh, uh, your experience during these uh, uh, post lockdown months uh, where you have uh, given a super experience to your customers and they've been coming back to you you managed to build that brand connect with them and uh, here's wishing you all the best of uh, going ahead as well thanks so much thank you so much thank you thank, thank, thank you so aparna for the time so hey when was the last time you walked into a bank honestly i have been just doing online for the longest time ever i mean i was like conditioned for online but now definitely i think that is the way forward but i yeah. have my own uh, little bit of uh, inhibition i don't know people still love to go the offline experience has its bit it will stay relevant but i we don't know when would that come would it be online or offline or would it be the com- combination of two but right now, i think so i am not ever going back i'm even scared to write a check because i feel even my signature will be wrong i forgot I mean, to give it a right check now and jared is agreeing i think what we are going <laughs> yeah perfect over to you i will see you soon um, A quick introduction about Jared. Jared, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Jared Gringas is the managing director and analyst of the Real Story Group. Uh, he has um, uh, been covering the omni-channel digital marketing technologies, uh, including digital asset management, omni-channel content platforms, web content management, email and marketing um, automation, and a whole lot more. Jared is also the co-author of the book The Right Way to Select Technology. He has advised clients like Delta Air, Coca-Cola, Ford, Harvard Business School and many more. Such a pleasure and privilege to have you with us Jared. Uh, you know uh, there are so many solutions there. We want to understand, you know, we are oh. also getting questions on how do you build your state of the art martech martech stack? How does it look like? How do you build? What do you pick? What do you give up? 
what are the solutions that uh, uh, will fulfill your needs and how you know data analytics mi ai are going to help in the personalization of customer experience take it away please tell us um, how we can navigate this treacherous path Great. Thank you so much. And thank you for just inviting me to be a part of this today. I, I've very much enjoyed all the speakers that have, that have preceded me. Um, it's been a, been a fantastic discussion. So thank you. So I think it's, I think it's important to start off with a, a bit of a disclaimer because, you know, the title of this session today is the state of the art MarTech stack. And just like Dr. Durga earlier said, there is no easy solution for putting in a stack. You can't just buy a stack from a, from a vendor and expect to get your stack out of a box and everything to work perfectly. Um, just like that is true, you know, in my experience, I've yet to see a perfect stack uh, among our clients. You know, no one's doing omni-channel perfectly. No one has the state-of-the-art MarTech stack. But what, what we're all doing, and as, as some of our other speakers have, have uh, talked about today, is we're all on this journey to this common goal though. We all want to delight our, our customers and our constituents at every single touch point. And if that's our common goal, we need to put a stack in place that allows us to do that. So what I'm going to show you today is what we're seeing from our clients and in, in kind of amalgamate some of those themes that we're seeing from our, our clients to show you uh, some models that, that we think might help you in, in constructing your, your your state-of-the-art MarTech stack, uh, at least as it exists in, on your stage of the journey. So a little bit of context here. Real Story Group, the company that, uh, that I work with, and it's a industry analyst firm that monitors a number of different technology marketplaces with the goal of really helping our clients make the right decisions for what it is they're trying to do. Now that manifests itself in several different ways. Number one, we help people pick the right technology. Um, number two, we advise our clients on their overall omni-channel stacks, a lot of what we'll be talking about today. And the third way we work with our clients is more of this council level, level engagement where we bring together our clients to, to work with each other and, and learn from each other as peers. And then not only do they learn from each other, we learn from them, we pass along some of our research, but they, these clients then inform our research roadmaps as well. So again, a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you today is directly from these people who are making decisions at, at some of the largest uh, enterprises in the world. We call ourselves a different kind of analyst firm. We, we don't think we're, we're built in the same vein as kind of the traditional analyst firms, and that's for a couple different reasons. Number one is our focus. We're only looking at omni-channel technologies today. And the other reason is our independence. Um, we don't work for software vendors in any way, okay? We don't work, speak at their conferences. We don't uh, accept meals from them. We don't write white papers for them. We don't advise them on the product strategy. Our goal is to solely sit on the buyer side of the table and, and help you make the right decisions for what it is you're trying to do. So let's look at the first model. This is, this is the world that we live in. You know, this is our kind of famous or infamous uh, subway map, if you will, where we try to plot the, the different marketplaces that we're watching on a daily basis. If you break it down, there's, I think, eight different subway lines that each of which represents a different um, marketplace. And uh, on, those, on those subway lines are a number of stops. Um, and I think we're, we're up to about, uh, about 125 different um, software products from over 100 different software vendors that we're constantly watching. And these are what we'll call the most significant in the, in, in the marketplace. You know, we're certainly very cognizant that there's new vendors coming on every day, but we think these are the most significant in the marketplace as we see it today. And we're, the good news that I'll, that I'll pass on to you as buyers is you have options. Not only do you have some of the biggest names in software at the, at the hubs, if you will, of, of, this, uh, of this map, but you also have a lot of best of breed options in the periphery. And I think having options, while it can be daunting at times, is fundamentally good. I think, you know, if we, were, if, if we had a single vendor dominating, I think we'd all be feeling pretty restricted, but to have this type of options is good. So options are good, but how we 
digest all this information that's being thrown at us from all these different different vendors is is makes this difficult and that's what i that's what i think we as analysts are here to to help with we're going to help try to make sense of this and i'm going to give you some frameworks today to help you see the marketplace in a different way and ultimately see how you, you can construct your stack in a way that sets you up for for the most kind of success so it wouldn't be a, a MarTech presentation without this slide, right? We've already seen it a couple times today, and I'm sure you'll see it more times over the next few days. And I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you have Scott from Chief MarTech uh, as one of your speakers. But I love this. I love this this diagram. Um, not because I can make any sense about it, but but it just shows that there is so this this world is is crazy. Let's be honest. It, there's so many options. There's eight thousand different vendors on here competing for your your attention, your, your uh, wallet spend, and a place in your stack, right? All of them are trying to get into your stack. They're trying to carve off little pieces of your stack, and some of them are trying to carve off large pieces of your stack. And, and again, this, this goes back to this 8,000 vendors is, is too much for anyone to make sense of. So we have to start making some, making some um, choices here as to what we're going to focus on and where we're going to um, apply our attention, our money, and, and who we're going to give a piece of our stack to. So in order to do that, I'm going to present you with a, a mental model that I like to use. Now, the shopping mall is, is maybe not as popular as it, as it once was a, a decade ago, but I think, I think many, many of us are, are still very familiar with the concept of anchor stores and specialty stores and kiosks in the hallway. Um, the mall is, beta, be, is, is made up of, of all sorts of different sizes and offerings. And you know, when we look at the, at the options presented to us as, as buyers of MarTech technology, I think it's important that we, we start to think in this lens and, and say that, you know, all 8,000 of those vendors on the previous slide are not created equal. We need to identify which are our foundational elements. What are our anchor stores? What are our specialty stores? And what are our, what are our kiosks that, that allow us for a little bit more experimentation? We might be able to be easy to switch in and out, uh, out of, but which, which are our anchor stores that we're going to truly build around. So we kind of use this model in working with a number of our different, different clients. Here's one example um, that we did with, with one client where we identified web content management and digital asset management and marketing automation, analytics, and CRM as, as their anchor stores. Now, it's, it's important for me to point out at this stage that your MarTech mall is going to be different from this MarTech mall. Everyone's MarTech mall is different. And, and that's okay, but but it, it, what I'm challenging you all to do is not look at all those vendors equally, but identify what are your foundational anchors in your, in your organization? What should be the foundational uh, systems and technologies that you're going to build your stacks upon? So that's, that's step number one. The next thing that I wanted to call out here is if we, once we identify our anchors, how do we start to put the pieces together? So as analysts, what we try to do to help our clients here is to, is to give you some reference models to, to kind of challenge your, your thinking and get you to think in, in, in maybe uh, different ways than you've thought before. And this is not, this is not a new concept, but even, even back 20 years ago when we started this company, we started out with some early reference models in the early 2000s to talk about how people were executing on the multi-channel challenge. Now, people might have been talking about omni-channel back then, but let's be honest, they were really doing multi-channel at, at best. And many of you still today are doing multi-channel at best. But this is, a, this is a, one of our early reference models which showed some source content from databases, structured content, unstructured content, and some media you know, being sent to a, to a single technology, and in many cases, a, a, an early content management system that had some library services like check-in, check-out, version control, um, and maybe some factory business services like, like some rudimentary workflows. And then ultimately, this single system would publish out to multiple channels. Now, those channels were pretty rudimentary back in the early 2000s, but you know, we're talking web pages, some wireless devices, you know, we're talking about XML syndication and, and maybe, maybe we're generating something like PDFs, but simple, simple model to think about, about consolidating different types of information into a central point and then distributing to multiple channels. And that worked for a while until we got to the, 
2010s where we started to get a little bit more serious about consistency um, of our brand, of our message, of our content, because we started to add more channels, more areas where our clients and, and constituents are interacting with our content, our assets, our experiences. So as more channels came, came along, we, we, the demand to do this better and, and more consistently um, became, became more and more important. So what we saw happening in the, in the 2010s is what we're calling this horizontal integration. So as we, I'll point your, your attention to the, to the area, the, the band, the third band um, from the top, which we call our content and engagement management band. And this is where these technology emerged to serve different, different touch points. So all, in addition to the web content management systems that we had in the early 2000s, we started to think about more of in terms of marketing or automation as it comes to our email. You know, can we, can we automate uh, how we reach segments of our, of our customers? Also, we, we started to have this new channel in terms of social, social networks. And we needed a better way to, to control our message to different, different people in, in the social arena. And so what we started to do is say, we can't, have, we can't be having different messages in, in all of these different, different channels. So, we, so what happened was there was this point-to-point -point integration that started to happen. So in a perfect world, your organizations recognize the need for an asset management system to control their images and their video. And then they push that, those assets to these various systems, whether it's the web content management, the marketing automation, or the social engagement tools. And likewise, you had point-to-point -point integrations between web content management and your email tools or your web content management and your social tools. But it was, it was a little bit disjointed, you know, and only, only the most sophisticated companies out there did, had, had, had any type of integration across the board. So this was useful and, uh, for, for, for many years, but what resulted um, in the early 2020s is, is something like this where not, not, only, um, not only are these, these content and engagement management arenas where your employees that are creating experiences doing most of their work, they tend to, these, these systems tend to get more bloated and bloated and bloated as more content got in there, more data got into these systems, more rules and, and personalization rules, segmentation rules started filling up your web content management systems, your email marketing tools, your social engagement tools. And then you add into other, other tools like, like Salesforce. And, um, you know, when you think about the people who are manning your, your call centers and they, they have all this information that they're passing along to the people who, who call in and, and, and ask questions. And that was all well and good, but these systems became bloated and bloated and bloated and invariably disconnected from each other. And so we see these silos uh, developing. So I think that theme around these silos developing um, really, really started to uh, have, a, have a bit of backlash uh, when it came to what customers were experiencing um, and, and many organizations started to feel some pain from, from a disjointed experience that their, that their customers were experiencing. And I think, I think it's important to, to talk about as, as marketers, as, as anyone who's creating experiences in today's day and age, what are we trying to do? We're all trying to create omni-channel experience across the board at every single touch point. Absolutely. So what does that mean? We want to get the right content and message to the right person in the right content at the right time and ideally measure the effectiveness, right? If that's the perfect world. At, and we need to be able to account for the channels we know about today. And we need to be able to account for the channels we don't know about in the future because none of us could have predicted every single channel that we need to publish to today, nor do we know what's coming next, right? So we need to prepare for ourselves for an unknown future in a way that, that truly scales um, so that we're not reinventing the wheel every, every time. But unfortunately, like I, like I alluded to earlier, the reality that many, many organizations are in today are that this content, this data, these engagement rules, our planning and, and oversight capabilities and our analytics 
have found themselves in all these different silos, right? I, I know that many of you have, have really bloated web content management systems that have a lot of web only content, a lot of customer data and product data built into those systems, a lot of journey rules and engagement rules that are really quite well and, and uh, well done and, and, and organized, but they're only for the web or, or mobile. You start to want to apply those same journey rules, those same decisions that you're, that you're applying to your website, to these other channels. And it's really hard because they're all that content and data and rules and analytics are stuck in these, in these, in these systems. And it's hard to break out of that. And unfortunately for customers, they're feeling that pain. As Dr. Durga said earlier, you know, he, he gave some great examples about how he, you know, some things he viewed on his, on his mobile device. And when he went to the website, he'd get different pricing, different experiences altogether. And, and that leads to a lot of distrust and in many cases, abandonment by the customer and, uh, or potential customer. And, and, and we just can't have that. We've got to break down these silos. So some of the reasons for these silos, you know, I think it's just kind of how we all grew up. Um, you know, the, we we had this is we're still in early days days of, of, of the digital world. So believe it or not, I think you know if we if we look back twenty years ago, you know when when our CMS was our was our main main uh, communication channel to to multiple uh, to multiple outputs. You know, we we were all learning as to what the capabilities of this type of technology were, and so we aligned our teams to those technologies. I'm sure many of you have some very specific web teams, and a social team, and an email team, and maybe you have a sales team. Um, but and and oftentimes, or too often, I should say, these teams don't don't coordinate and don't even talk to each other and don't share what they're what they're doing. So. What we're seeing is that creative content and messaging can become very channel specific. And, and again, these content data and rules become platform specific rather than enterprise specific. And if that's the case, it's impossible to create customer experiences. So how do we do something different? So I'm gonna to present to you today, my view of where the, the stack of the future is going. And as I mentioned, this is a journey. So some organizations are further along this journey than others, and some of them are, uh, some are just getting started, and some are doing this fairly well, but no one's perfect. So what I'm going to introduce to you today is, a, is a, what we like to call a foundational layer to our stack. And here I'm going to talk about ways that you can implement systems that house the fundamental building blocks of experiences. I mean, you're going to hear me say this time and time again, the, your core content, your core data, your core rules, your core analytics, your core decisions, your core planning and, uh, capabilities. If you identify what your core building blocks are that are independent of a channel and you can store them at a foundational layer that can then feed your systems of engagement at a, at a middle tier, these are, the, these are the enterprises that are going to be most poised to scale for both today and that unknown future that I mentioned. So let's dig into a, a few of these uh, core, core pieces, if you will. And again, I, I do, I do want to just say that this is, this is a, a single view. This is not a perfect view. Um, depending on your enterprise, your, your core building blocks might, might take a, a slightly different direction as well. Um, one, one example that I'll throw out to, to some of you, if you're a CPG company, you might, one of your core building blocks might be uh, your product information. Uh, so your, your PIM system might be one of these, one of these uh, pieces here as well. But in general, I think most of our organizations can recognize that for us, our building blocks are content. So the, we, we, we started calling um, this, red, this red block in our, in our stack our omni-channel content platform. And when I, what I think about when I think what should go in an omni-channel content platform, this should be my single source of truth for core customer engagement objects. So this might be assets, this might be stories, this might be themes, this might be micro experiences, this might be snippets of text that are relevant to, to, to channels across the board, um, but, they're, but they're independent of the, of the destination, they're core asset, core um, pieces of content that can be utilized by anyone across the organization. 
the orange box here is also pivotal to to most enterprises and that's that and i and i've heard this come up today it's that single view of your customer right and and the uh, dr durga brought this up earlier as well and uh, he as he highlighted the the importance of of the the cdp or the customer data platform as a marketer's view into what we know about our our customers so that we're able to 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 align that content with the with with the the right customer right if we know if we have a good view about those two building blocks we're we're, we're well down our our journey but speaking of journey i think what ties this all together is the rules we need to put in place so that we can determine what content gets delivered to which customers and when and how and so I think there's, there's a lot of emphasis being placed right now from or especially forward thinking organizations as to how can we manage the decisions um, and, and rules that we place to deliver which content when to which customers. So we might have different rules in place to say, if someone went to, went to Facebook or Twitter or LinkedIn and engaged with a piece of our, our content in the social arena, but then filled out a form on our site, um, and we, we know they, they called the call center um, three times, maybe there's a specific piece of content that we want to push to that, to that user. Um, likewise, maybe there's a, a totally different piece of, of, of content, a different message, a different experience altogether that we want to uh, send to someone who's engaging with our content for the first time, right? It's a very different journey and we need to think about journeys, not in terms of a channel specific platform, but as something that we can manage across platform. And then finally, the green box here, you know, to do this right, this is sort of the holy grail of, of, of all management in, in the marketing space. Everyone wants to have a, a clear view of what's going on across MarTech, across all of their campaigns, across all of their panic, planning, across all of their resources. And, and this, this notion of, of you know, having a dashboard view that gives insight into what, what content is, is flowing through the pipeline, what people are working on, what we're spending on this. And then in a perfect world, a round trip analytics coming back to say, is what we're spending worth it? Is it having an impact? And can we prove that it's having an impact? And can we, can we prove that certain things are working better than others? And, and can we use that, those analytics to inform us to make really smart future decisions? So that's, the, that's the holy grail if we can, if we can uh, achieve it. So here's another view of that, of that holy grail. If you have a, these foundational elements in place, I think we can be sure that we're creating consistent messaging. We can make our customers feel that they actually, uh, the, that the organizations actually know us. We can have uh, coherent interaction from system to system to system and touch point to touch point to touch point. We can have consistencies of our stories and we can have true relevant data coming back to us so that we can improve on this, on this experience and make smart decisions going forward. So I give this to you as a, as a again, a reference model. It's, it's a model to challenge you to think a little bit differently. Um, I, I, I hope that you think about what your building blocks are and, and, and create that foundational layer. And one of the interesting impacts that we've seen um, coming out of this is for organizations that have put some of these foundational platforms in place that are a little bit further on this, this journey, we've seen that content and engagement management platform tier actually get thinner, right? So you, maybe you don't need as heavy weight of a web content management tool or social publishing tool or email marketing tool or even, even sales tool. What if you could thin out those systems and make those a little bit simpler and instead, you know, put your, put your resources in, in developing this foundational layer that is truly uh, focused on what is appropriate for the entire enterprise. So I'll leave you with this, a few takeaways. So number one, as I mentioned, the state-of-the-art omni-channel stack is aspirational. No one has that state-of-the-art stack just today, but there are, but if there, this is probably the, one of the, uh, I'd say one of the biggest themes that we've noticed from all our, all our clients, no matter what industry they're in, 
everyone is trying to do this. They might call it different things, but everyone is trying to create consistent on-brand experiences at every single touch point. I challenge you to identify your anchors. Everyone's anchors are not the same, but really push yourself to thinking about what are, what are our true building blocks for our experiences to create delightful experiences for our customers. Break down those silos. Wherever you can, move those foundational building blocks lower into your stack. Maybe you can thin out your experience and engagement layers, but move those foundational building block elements lower in your stack. And I think if you do this right, what you're doing is you're, you're trying to find that, that right balance between structure and flexibility. Just like that shopping mall, right? If you put those, those foundational stores, those anchor stores in place, the right anchor stores in place, hopefully you're not swapping those out on a, on a regular basis. Hopefully those are there for the long term. But it gives you the flexibility to, to, to swap out you know, the kiosks or the specialty stores because we all know there's more technology hitting the market every single day. More experimentation needs to happen and should happen. But I think your, your organization will be in a better position to, for that experimentation if you have those foundational layers in place. And finally, one size just certainly does not fit all. This, is, this reference model is, is to challenge you and get you to think about what should be in your stack. But there, isn't a, there, isn't, there aren't two companies out there that have the exact same stack, the exact same vendors in it. And uh, that, that's where the hard work is. And uh, I, I, I wish you all the best of luck in, in figuring out what should be in your state-of-the-art stack. Thanks so much, Jarrett, uh, for that presentation. Certainly, there is no holy grail to this, no easy way out. But thanks for giving us a lot of pointers on how to figure it out for, uh, for our own company, for our own brand. We have uh, one question that is coming up. Um, uh, the question is, is there a way to decide what works in which country? Or are solutions universal? No, it's a great question. And, and I think... I think in a perfect world, sure, we'd, we'd all, it would be a, an equal playing field, but it's just not the reality. Geography is still important. Now, I think we've made a lot of progress over the years. I, I, I think we're getting to a point where it's, it, it maybe is less important than, than we might have been 10, 15, 20 years ago. But I, in, in many cases, geography is still important. And maybe this is, this is going to sound strange coming from the technology analyst. To me, it's not necessarily about how the technology is constructed, because I think, you know, that is not ge geography sp specific. But I think where, where the differences really rise up is in terms of do you have the, the skill sets locally to do an implement, implementation correctly, to get the support you need to, you know, once you're up and running to make sure you're using the technology correctly. I think those softer skills that surround the, uh, a technology are really where it can, it can break down um, from a geographic perspective. And, and we've seen that with, with some of our clients who, um, you know, they felt some pain going, out, going with, with, a, with a vendor that didn't have resources in their area and, and didn't understand their market. And, uh, and, 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 you know, that's where we, we usually see that kind of pain. Right. There is one question from my side, Jared. Uh, you know, you said that in an omni-channel strategy, uh, you know, we want to look the same. We want to speak to one in one voice to our customer. Uh, is that really very important, or is it more important to offer the solution to the customer, even if it's not available on all different platforms? But take him to that one platform that he given the solution. Uh, if that is where you're starting first, instead of planning to have, all, you know, the solutions on every every possible platform, should we then take them to the one platform where they will get what they need? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, and, and there's, there's no right answer there. I mean, in some cases, you might be right. In some cases, it might make more sense to direct people to a, a single a single source. But in other cases, that's just not an option. You you have to be you have to give someone that mobile experience, right? It, you know, you can't wait for them to go back and get back home and, and check it out on their laptop or, or or something like that. But I think I think the critical piece here is, and and going back to Apoorv's examples earlier today, what we can't have is a disconnecting experience, you know, that jarring disconnect. We can't have just 
the wrong price showing up or one price showing up in one experience and, and one in another, you'll just lose trust completely of your, of mm. your, your customer. Right. And, and, and that's where people go somewhere else. Right. If, if I don't trust you, I'm going to leave. And, mm. and I think that's where to me, it's unacceptable. You get, you've got to get the, you got to be on brand on message. And quite frankly, you got to be accurate in your data. Um, mm. So if you can't do that, don't, don't create an experience there, Just figure it out a different way. Mm. But, mm. but you, you have to be, you have to get those things right. All right. Jared, thank you so much for uh, joining us on this webinar and sharing with us your wealth of knowledge on um, how we can pick and choose on what is going to work uh, for our market stack. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Anisha. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I would also like uh, to thank uh, everybody joining us on this webinar. If you've taken away something really interesting, something that's going to stay with you long after this webinar is done, do tweet or uh, uh, do share your thoughts on uh, social media. Use the hashtag MarkTechIndia and uh, the hashtag E4M webinar and share your thoughts uh, with everyone. Uh, we hope uh, that the insights shared by our experts today will put you in a position to reinvent your marketing strategy to include MarTech and uh, to leverage it to get you uh, the answers that, that you want, the traffic that you want, the revenues that you want, the results that you want. A big thank you to the Exchange for Media team that has worked tirelessly to make uh, uh, this possible. Thank you for uh, giving a platform for everybody to join in and share uh, their knowledge. Thank you so much.